Welcome to our scientific YouTube channel. We are a group of scientists and actually it's a German channel. But every now and then one of us gets invited giving English talks. So we thought it might be a good idea to have them recorded as well as our German talks. Just to see if you like it. Hartmut starts with a talk he gave at the IPP Summer University on Plasma Physics and Fusion Research, September 2019. He is one of the directors at the Max Planck Institute. If you're more interested in the subject, you'll find another talk given at the same symposium by Richard Pitts, Eater, the next step. Thanks for watching. envisioning a fusion reactor and it will actually I I don't have to say much about ITER because you have heard one hour 30 plus epsilon about ITER now um, demo Richard mentioned already which we think is a demo so we think after ITER is something called demo which is a demonstration reactor which should bring electricity to the grid in some form and FPP stands for any kind of fusion power plant which again brings electricity to the grid. And if you like, the biggest difference maybe between these two in our perception is that we hardly think that the demonstration reactor will be built by a company. This will be still built by public money, we think, as a demonstration project. And then the fusion power plant, what we think of, would really be then, I don't know, know who in the world buying in and building fusion reactors and making money with it. But both demo and fusion power plant, I will not make a big distinction actually during the talk because they should both be self-sufficient in tritium production and producing electricity to the grid. Okay, so I will briefly talk about what the roadmap to fusion energy looks like in the European present state. So different countries have different roadmaps of different realism and of different money that is underlying the roadmaps so, for example, the biggest, the biggest um, optimist, optimism you will usually find in the US roadmap and the biggest money beyond it, below it, you will usually find in the Chinese roadmap and somewhere in between uh, other people are sitting. And I will only tell you what uh, Europe thinks about. Then, designing a fusion power plant, you have heard a lot about plasma physics and very complicated stuff, turbulent transport and so on, MHD stability. I will show you how you can put together four or five algebraic equations which would to zeroth order describe where a fusion power plant would sit in parameter space. And it's actually very nice that you can do it. It's only algebraic. It, it looks a bit odd because exponents are funny, but it, in the end you can just plug into and plot everything with a very small Python script on your computer, for example, and you get roughly already a dimensioning of a fusion reactor. And I give you examples. And since we are at IPP, where we run both the Tokamak experiment and a stellarator experiment up in the Greifswald branch of IPP. I will show you examples for Tokamak and for the stellarator. Okay, so let's go and look at the fusion roadmap. This was not produced by myself, but by the public relations department of Eurofusion, so it's very nice. And of course, the first thing we talk about is ITER, which Richard has talked about a lot about where we are at present 2020. He was, I think, if I look correctly, very careful not to talk too much about timescales. We also have one where there are not even years here, but it says now, immediate future, more distant future or something like this. But the present date when ITER should be ready for doing the very first plasma is about 2025. And I guess it's already the 31st of December 2025, so it might well slip into 2026. But with the progress that Richard showed, this is sort of the timeline we are envisaging. This will be a plasma which will not produce fusion energy. So there is a 8 to 10 years frame, we think, where you reinforce the machine, where you do the experiments before you can do the full blast thing and get fusion energy out of it. So it means it will start to be more and more interesting and, and uh, exciting and at some point maybe in the mid 2030s or so it will go to full performance and at some point show the cubicles then. And so this is the job of ITER, showing burning plasma physics, showing that you can get a positive output, not electricity to the grid, but more 
heating produced in the plasma by the alpha particles, then you need externally in order to supply externally in order to keep the thing alive. And Q equals 10 just means 10 times the fusion power is 10 times the input power in there. This does not mean actually the electricity which goes out is 10 times the electricity. In fact, we will see this later. If you put in the ether numbers, uh, it's actually a net electricity consumer, even if we would put electricity generators there. But this is not the goal of ether. Okay, then we have this next step. I already said this is a so-called demo. We are working in a what we call pre-conceptual and conceptual design phase, means that we put together ideas about technologies and designs and <coughs> roughly scope where the machine would sit. And consistent conceptual design means that somewhere by 2030 you would have to be ready to say, if ITER works, this is the European strategy, we will build this and we are pretty damn sure that it will deliver electricity to the grid. And in Europe we say, we do this sequentially, we wait for, this is why there is a sequence like this, we wait for ITER to show Q equals 10. This is the positive proof that everything works as a proof of principle and then we start the next day and pour the concrete for demo or maybe with a bit of a distance. And very importantly, if you are willing to take more risks, you could change this schedule. This is of course a, a safe way, going sequentially. You will see, if you look at the newspapers for example, you will see a lot of people who say we can go faster with fusion. <coughs> there are people who say we can build in some years magnets which have double the magnetic field than our present day magnets, which I've mentioned this and the machine becomes smaller. We can do this in parallel to ITER and maybe 2035 or so we will already be somewhere where we can produce electricity. The difference to the path here is that this is much more risky because it is making huge extrapolations. So if you look at the different proposals at present, you have to see that this is a question of who is willing to finance what and what risk are you willing to take. In fact, our Chinese colleagues, by Richard mentioned this as well, will probably build a machine from the 2020s on which would run in parallel to ITER have sort of the same fusion performance, but already try to close the fuel cycle so that it's tritium self-sufficient, because they realize this problem of the tritium. And this is because China puts more money and China has a bigger energy problem than the EU, for example, and is ready to take bigger steps and bigger risk in this. So sometimes I'm asked in these talks, there is this fusion constant, fusion is always 30 years away or so. This may be true, it's no longer with ITER actually, because we are coming closer to where we produce net fusion energy and on top of this, this depends very much on how desperate you are and how much money you want to put into this. And actually a, one of the very wise Russian academicians when he was thought when fusion would be ready to be supplied said fusion will be ready when mankind needs it. Saying that if mankind really needs it, we could go faster, I think. And you wouldn't go much faster in building the machine like Ita, um, Richard has shown you. You would do things in parallel because, as my Chinese colleagues say, failure is an option. So if you, if failure, failure is an option for you, so you can buy three eaters, so build three wildly different eaters, and one of them is successful and two don't work, and you don't have to present your head on the table when the first one does not work. You can go along that route. Okay. Then we have something materials. I don't know if this was mentioned, but there needs to be materials testing and qualification in the high neutron flux and <coughs> fluence. And for this, we will need a dedicated fusion neutron source, which is called either an early version donors in the European program or IFMIF International Facility for Materials ir Irradiation, something like this. You need this in parallel in the strategy. And of course, since it's Europe and since we have a strong science program, there are all the present day devices and coming devices which end the modeling and the theory, which give input to all of this. Now largely to how we think we will operate in the best manner ITER, not so much how we design ITER, because you've seen in Richard's talk, if you now come and say, I want to change the number of toroidal field coils, you will probably have a hard time defending this. But if you can shorten the period from first eta plasma to Q equals 10 by one year, for example, because you do research cleverly and say, oh, I think you should run the plasma current like this, that would be a big effort actually and a big improvement for this. Okay, and then we have the Stellarator, of course, coming in here. So there is the Stellarator you have heard about, the biggest one in the world now being operated in Greifswald. At some point we will have to decide if this is a viable option for a fusion power plant 
and then go somewhere into this first fusion power plant here. And in the end, I will talk a bit about the Stellarator and how we, th we envision in Europe and in Germany that the Stellarator could play a role here. And then there is all sorts of concept improvements and innovations, which maybe that don't change too much the demo design, but make the thing more robust, more reliable, cheaper, more attractive. You can do a lot, a lot of these things which are unique things which are built first of a kind at some point would go into mass production and might be much cheaper by this. And in fact, people who look at this also look at how do you produce things different, for example, by 3D printing rather than milling and, and working on this and, and all these technologies. You have to think that this is in 30 years from now, so the world will look much more different and also mechanical engineering might be very much different from what we have now. Okay, so now let's quickly say what we do in the EU for this. Our approach is something we call a step ladder to fusion energy. We have, for example, Aztec's upgrade. This is a cross-section of the machine. I'm sure you have seen these cross-sections over and over the whole week. There is JET, the biggest European experiment. There is ITER and there is DEMO. And they all look pretty much the same, except that the meter becomes smaller and smaller if you go from the left to the right. Meaning, of course, if you look in real space, only Aztec upgrade jet and ETA, there is a large increase in the size. And it's roughly a factor of two in linear dim dimension, but of course the volume goes with the third power, so it's, it's a factor of eight or almost ten in the volume between these, and then in the end also for the cost you can assume that it sort of scales with the volume, roughly with the volume of high-tech material which you're putting in there. And just to say this again, this step ladder approach, this was on this slide, there is a scaling, it's like a wind tunnel scaling, and I will show you these scalings for an energy confinement, for example, which Richard has already used. They rely on a sort of engineering approach to some extent at present. So you have a database, you fit through this database with a functional dependence that you think will lead you there. In the end, upscaling would require a solid theoretical understanding and there is fundamental research going on as well. So with energy confinement time is one of the big things you have heard because it's governed by this turbulent transport. Turbulent is a, turbulence is a horribly complicated thing to research on and actually if you want a number for this transport you really have to do large-scale computer simulations. I think Eric was talking about the numerical plasma physics and, and how theory is brought on computers in his lecture this morning and clearly we have to do all this in, if we want to extrapolate sort of in, in a sound manner in this. So we have a science program going on it's actually where the students already come today to our machines, not so much to ITER as Richard said, but we have, I don't know, 40, 50 PhD students at IPP regularly and they are all from many in physics, some in engineering or in mathematics and informatics and they work on problems which are basic science for this. Okay, so ASTIC's upgrade, a machine of the present size which we run here, is a pathfinder if you like, so it's sort of flexible and in this strategy and it's the smallest step in the strategy if you like, in the one which I have shown you. We can demonstrate exhaust, active stability control, heat insulation, all these things, but the question comes of course what does it mean for ITER if we find something on Aztec's upgrade and ITER is so much bigger and this is where the role of JET comes in. One thing is this upscaling, for example, the heat insulation, many other things. The other, of course, it only makes sense to start and try deuterium-tritium experiments if the conditions you reach in the plasma are close enough that you see significant fusion power, which in ASIC's upgrade is not the case. I showed the numbers, I didn't say them, ASIC's upgrade. If you, if you heat ASIC's upgrade with 20 megawatts and you would put in deuterium-tritium, which we don't do, you would maybe see 2 megawatt of fusion power. Jet, put in 25 megawatt and got out 16 megawatt of fusion power, so it comes much closer already to this break even. And JET actually did show in the 90s these experiments and is towards the end of its lifetime going to do another DT experiment in order to show that all our understanding of the scaling of the DT reactions and of the fusion power will be correct. Then we have ITER, which Richard has talked so much about, I will not do, except that I, made, I noticed when you mentioned it, I have a number. <laughs> Whatever that means, um, I think this is an official number that the EU quoted some three years ago or so when they calculate 60% of this to be the cost which it is for the EU, whatever it is. But as Richard says, this is not a number of million or billion dollars that flows over the table. This is a number of value of components which are procured and brought 
together in this. Okay, and build in this international joint effort with all these partners here. And now demo, the next step. What is demo? It's in our strategy, as you saw, the step between ITER and the fusion power plant. There is no unique definition. I said we are in a conceptual design phase. And in fact, I will show you in the next slide four different cross sections of demo, which uh, differ in the assumptions. So they differ in the optimism you have put into the assumptions. But it should find a workable solution for all physics and technology questions together. There should be nothing. So for example, if, if you're done with ITER, you will say we have shown you're successfully done with ITER. You will say we have proven self-heating of plasmas and large production of fusion power of heat by fusion power. So this is great. But you will also have to say we have an idea about the tritium breeding because we have these test blanket models. We haven't shown that we can breed as much tritium as the machine would consume. And this is something that after demo should no longer be the case. You should have a solution to each all of these problems. So it should have self-sufficient fuel cycle and at some point have high reliability and availability over a reasonable time span. Meaning that we would think there should be a mode in which a demo runs more or less 24 hours a day and then seven days a week and then maybe not 365 days in a year but say for three, four months or so. And if it runs like this then, then I think you can convince the utilities to say this is something that runs safe and clean and you can go ahead and, and deploy this in some sense. And note the careful wording. It should allow an assessment of the economic prospects of a fusion power plant. And it's worded so careful because of course also demo is a unique thing and it, lots of things are first of a kind. So you cannot expect that the cost of demo will be the same as for a fusion power plant. It will be higher because first of a kind always takes much more and it is still you, you develop and qualify technologies which later on you would use in a fusion power plant. So it is rather that the extrapolation shows that fusion power is economically viable and not that um, demo sells its electricity for, I don't know, 20 euro cents a kilowatt hour or so. This is not the plan for it at present. Okay. And so as I said in the Euro roadmap, this is a single step between ITER and the fusion power plant and you might go and do things in parallel or sequence differently depending on how much money you have in your pocket or in your politicians pockets. Okay, this is the same that I said before, alpha heating, then alpha heat demo, alpha heating plus electricity production plus self-sufficient fuel supply. And uh, Richard mentioned this and I will show you the equations how we come to this very simply actually in the next part of the talk. But um, demo will be larger but not much larger because ITER is 6.2 6 meters major radius and the demos we are looking at are 8 to 9 meters maybe. So it is larger but you saw a factor of 2 in linear dimension from ASIX upgrade to ITER. You saw a factor of 2, sorry, from ASIX upgrade to JET. You saw another factor of 2 from JET to ITER. You will not see another factor of 2, 12 meters in demo or so. That's it. And you can in some sense expect that uh, 8 to 9 meters will be not too much bigger, closer to ITER than when you go from JET to ITER in terms of the size of the machine and of the plasma. And in fact, this is now a European study of power plants, which you may take as a proxy for demo. And depending, they all have sort of 1 to 1.5 gigawatt of electrical power, but depending on the optimism which you put into your design, the cross-section can actually be number D is the size of ITER. So it just assumes that you can get much better performance than ITER is projecting and by this you can actually with the same geometrical size of ITER produce a fusion power plant already and others which are very pessimistic might even turn out to be larger than the nine or eight or nine meters which I have shown you here. So you can see there is a progression for example also the system is much more efficient. I actually have no idea how from 2.5 gigawatts of thermal power, you extract 1.5 gigawatt of electrical power because usually this number is thought to be one third. And if I'm not mistaken, this is bigger than one half. So people have been very optimistic in this, but well, it's 30 years in the future. So you might, there is no principal limitation. For example, you can assume that you will use a coolant, which is different 
from water, helium for example. And if you run, the, you all know the Carnot cycle. If you run the coolant at much higher temperature, you can have a much higher thermodynamic efficiency because your Carnot cycle becomes more efficient. It goes one minus T2 over T1. And if T2 goes through the roof, then actually you are in a better position. So things like this have been assumed here. OK, but this also says, I just want to give you an impression that these are first scoping studies. And further advance in physics and technology could be very beneficial. So sometimes we show our EU program, say we are on the conservative side, we, we, we produce a present demo design, and then people say, well, this is very large, and it's not clear that this is attractive. And the answer is, of course, yes, but we still have 30 years' time, and we have 10 to 15 years' time before we start building it. So we do something now, but we do research on all these devices plus ITER, and this will allow us in the end. So you will see a range of things which we propose to do. OK? So now comes the part where there is some mathematics. I, know, I think Richard had not a single slide, slide which had a formula, right? <coughs> Fusion table product. OK. So you will see some formula now, but you will see that they are really simple in the sense they're all algebraic. So in terms of the mathematics, it's a piece of cake, actually. So. Um, how do we design a fusion power plant? How can everybody go home and design a fusion power plant, her or himself? Well, actually, to zeroth order is not so difficult, and you have learned most of the things that we need for this in this week. So if we look at a set of parameters to describe a fusion power plant, the design parameters of the machine, so the hardware, if you assume, so I'm assuming it's a tokamak, I will talk about the stellarator in a second. So it's the major radius the 6 meter of ETER, for example. It's the aspect ratio, which is the major to the minor radius. Large aspect ratio, mind you, like the stellarator is bicycle tube tire. Small aspect ratio is a donut, for example. There is the toroidal magnetic field, BT, which is limited by technology. And as Richard said, and I said before, there is now ideas to use, to use high temperature superconductors, which could go to much higher field but then the forces on the coils will be much higher, so it is quite a route to go. But there is an idea that if you could go to a higher magnetic field, you might win in this. And you have to specify the auxiliary heating and current drive power. I call this PCD because it will turn out a demo is always close to ignition. So the power balance is not given by the requirement to heat the plasma externally. It's given by the fact that the tokamak is not stationary. And you think that to make a very long pulse or to make it stationary, you always have to put some power to keep the current running in there. So it's P current drive rather than this. So these are the, this is actually only three numbers, four numbers, one, two, three, four, which you put into these equations. Then there is the plasma physics, there is the pressure. You remember there is this beta, which is the kinetic pressure normalized by the magnetic pressure. This is limited by MHD stability. So you will see the equations in a second, and they are phrased in these dimensionless parameters, normalized, dimensionless. And we have limits to them. There is the MHD stability. There is the density. Somebody talked about the Greenwald limit. OK, very good. I hope they all told you that it's an empirical limit, which we don't understand. <laughs> um, but it is an empirical limit, and it's a pretty clear experimental fact, so I will be using it. It means that you want to run as high as possible current in the tokamak, because the density that you can achieve goes with the current. Um, there is a limit to this because there is a normalized current, this safety factor Q, and if Q becomes too low, the safety factor is low, low safety, you get MHD instability, so this limits the available current. And then there is this confinement scaling, which is expressed by the scaling law that also Richard showed in the morning. And you can, again, and we see this in experiments, assume that you might perform a bit better than this confinement scaling, because it's only a scaling, it's not first principle physics. And this is quantified by this number h, the h factor scaling about the h confinement. So if h is 1, you have an h mode which scales like all this cloud of points that Richard showed you, for example. If h becomes bigger than 1, which we regularly achieve in experiments, it means you have made a trick by which the confinement is actually better than this. So for example, transport barriers, which I'm sure you have heard about, where turbulence is suppressed by shear rotation, stuff like this. So this is plasma physics. And in the end, we want to talk about the technology of the machine. So we describe the overall plant parameters by efficiencies. So there is a thermodynamic efficiency, which is how you convert thermal power to electrical power. And we will need one more efficiency, which is the eta CD, because 
The power that you deposit in the plasma by an ECRH system on your beams or so is one number, but the, tower, the power you take from the grid in order to produce this power is higher and it is usually at least a factor of two higher. So there is an efficiency which is 0.5 or lower by which you multiply the power you take from the grid in order to drive current in the plasma, for example. And this, of course, if you look at the overall power balance, not at the plasma Q, but at the total power amplification, electricity generation, you have to take this into account as well. And the maximum B, by the way, is limited by the technology choice of superconductor. I've said this already. So now we just can have a look. Is this different for the stellarator? Well, almost not. So there is a stellarator reactor, how we envision it. And everything is the same except the picture, <laughs> and you don't really have to drive current in the stellarator. This is the nice thing about the stellarator. It produces all the magnetic field with the coils from the outside. So you, need, you, you don't need current drive power. The limit, there is a limit uh, to the density in the stellarator as well. It just has a different name, and it's as unexplained as the Greenwald limit, I think. <laughs> so it's called the Sudo limit by a Japanese researcher, Mr. Sudo. And the safety factor, there is no constraint really, so there is a free choice of iota, which is 1 over q in principle, but if you put then here the scaling for the stellarator rather than for the H mode, and they are not too different by the way, you will find that also goes with a poloidal field, which is something like the current, so in the end the iota profile doesn't look too much different from what you have in the tokamak. Okay, so these are in principle very simple parameters, right? So the, the geometry of this, the power you put into it, the magnetic field value, and then these four plasma physics things, and off you go. And I will say a disclaimer, which I think Richard will not like. <laughs> the first one he will like, because uh, he talked already about there is power crossing the separatrix, which heats the wall and very importantly heats the diverter down here and you have to dissipate this power in order that it does not drill a hole or weld a hole into your diverter plate. This becomes more and more difficult with a larger machine because we found recently that the width of this layer which brings the power down to the diverter does not scale with the machine size. It is more or less independent of the machine size. So if you would expect you increase the machine, the major radius, you would think that the wetted area in which the power goes should at least go up with R squared but it only goes up linearly because the, the major radius of the circle goes up, but the, since the width is the same, you will end up with a not so much larger. It's nine by six, so it is a factor 1.5 larger area, but the power that potentially hits the plate is much larger because now we don't talk about 500 megawatt fusion power, we talk about 2.5 gigawatt fusion power, for example, and one fifth of this comes in charged particles. And the thing that I guess you will not like so much for the remainder of the talk, I will suppress this subject <laughs> just to make life easy because it becomes horribly complicated to put this into the equations, but you always have to keep it into the back, in the back of your mind. Once you have done this iteration cycle I show you, you will still have to solve the exhaust problem and it's a tough one and it becomes tougher with machine size. Okay, now equations and very simple ones. In the optimum temperature range you were hopefully shown that the fusion power goes like n times t squared. So n squared from the reactants and t squared from the curve, from the reaction curve, from the, the sigma mal v times v curve, which is the reaction parameter of the fusion reaction dt. So if it's n squared times t squared, you can call this p squared, which is the plasma pressure squared. This is a power density because uh, pressure is a density, energy density, if you like. So you have to multiply by the volume and you get the total fusion power. So it's as simple as this. We can say fusion power is proportional to P squared times V. Now, P we wanted to normalize by the magnetic field pressure. So we use beta, which is P over B squared. So you will get some beta squared because of the P, of the P squared here. And since it's normalized by B squared, you get B to the fourth and the r to the third is just the volume. And this is since I'm using beta in an MHD stability limiting expression, I get the Q95, but that's more or less a technical detail. You can think it's beta squared times b to the fourth times r to the third. This is the fusion power which comes out of the machine. 
Then you have to balance this versus the loss power because we are doing capital Q, we are doing a fusion power versus input power. So the loss power from the plasma is expressed by this eta scaling law, which in the normalized uh, quantities which I'm using here goes like a time constant before this, the H factor very strongly, 0.3 to 3.23. The very odd exponents come now from the fact that we don't talk about laws of nature, but we talk about an engineering scaling which has these funny exponents. So you saw on Richard's slide, I think, 0.63 or 0.69 for the power scaling, and then if you take 1 over 1 minus this, it actually becomes this funny 3.23, and there is a 0.73 and so on. But you would call this roughly linear going down. This is exactly minus 3, so you can get an idea about these scalings. And then it's very simple, the capital Q, where you usually think you have to integrate over profiles and blah blah blah, you can say it's fusion power over the auxiliary power, so it's fusion power over the total loss power minus one-fifth of the fusion power, which is the intrinsic alpha heating, remember one-fifth stays in the plasma for alpha heating, and then you just brutally insert all these quantities and you get a five over five times this guy minus one. So if you were to look at this as a physicist, you would say this is a resonance denominator. There is a singularity when this thing becomes one. And what does a singularity in capital Q mean? Of course, it means that the denominator becomes um, zero. So it means you don't have to supply auxiliary power anymore. This means ignited plasma. So this is a very simple formula. I mean, it looks ugly, but it's really simple to program. And you just put in your engineering parameters and you see where you have to go in order to take <coughs> capital Q to infinity. And if you program this, it in fact looks like this. So this is tokamak, this is fusion gain, capital Q, this is the major radius. And what I have done, I have assumed that ETA is the pinnacle of technology. So what we do in ETA, we will be able to do in demo, but I have not assumed any further progress in technology. And actually, you might assume we can have a progress, and this looks a bit more favorable then. So I have put the eta parameter, so I've put 5.2 Tesla, and I have said, let's assume demo can do as good as eta at least, so it will also do 5.2 Tesla. It will run in the same operational regime that eta does. And then I've normalized this. You see there was a free constant. There were some free constants, like this one here, for example, and there is another one. I've normalized these to eta, so at 6.2 meters capital Q is 10, just as the eta operational point. And if you go up, actually at 7.5 meters, you go to ignition. And so I'd set 8 to 9 because you have to put in a bit more effects in order to look at some volume effects and stuff. But pretty much this works. And this says exactly what we've been saying before, both of us. It is, yes, it's bigger than eta, but no, it is not so much bigger than eta. Okay, there is a certain irony that only people who are older than 50, I think, can appreciate. So it's not too many of you, but <laughs> us guys. Um, before 2000, there was an ETA design, which was eight meters, and it was aimed at ignition. And it would exactly have followed this. Because you could actually ask yourself as a bright young person, so why the hell did these guys go for 6.2 meters and not for 7.5? It doesn't look like it's so much more expensive. Actually, it turns out if the cost goes with a third power, it will roughly be a factor of two more expensive. And this was not possible at the time. So there was a cost estimate. ITER was designed like this. There was a cost estimate. Actually, our American friends left ITER for a while because they said this is too expensive and we will not be in ITER anymore. There was a comprehensive redesign saying now we aim not at Q infinity but Q equals 10, so we still have twice the alpha heating power than the external heating power, so it would still be a sort of self-heated machine. And you came up with a factor of two cheaper, less expensive machine, and then the US came back in and said we are happy with this design and this is the way the present ITER is designed. But I think I would, I would still like to be the machine just 10% bigger or 20% bigger and having this margin that we could probably go to ignition quite easily with this, but that's the way it is. I'm not sure that the factor of two we haven't already caught up again and doubled one more time or so, but this is life. <laughs> and of course, yes. 
Uh, no problem. With the, with the notion of these international units, ETA units of account, it is very simple uh, to change the exchange rate and cover whatever <laughs> you don't want to show. Okay, so this is the fusion queue. So it is the, uh, the thing up here. You can also look at the fusion power because at the same time you will produce fusion power. And since I fitted everything to ITER, no surprise, 6.2, I took an operational point with 400, not 500 megawatt, it will produce 400 megawatt of fusion power. So if you go to 7.5 meters, actually it is not so great because it will not even produce a gigawatt. And we think such a large device, which is of the order of a nuclear power plant in terms of investment, for example, a conventional fission power plant should produce probably a gigawatt thermal, sorry, a gigawatt electric, so it should produce rather two or three gigawatt thermal. And if you want to do this, you, it looks like you're stuck because I've used my formula and I have nothing else to do in there. Of course, I have the beta parameter, which I can vary within the stability limits. And if I increase the beta parameter or I increase the magnetic field, I can come to this blue curve where I have put this value in which ETA is very far away from stability limits, at least from ideal MHD stability limits, so in a very comfortable zone. And I went closer to the limit, which is probably 3.5 for this configuration. If you do so, you can see at 7.5 or 8, you would actually go and produce 2 or 3 gigawatt of fusion power. So there is a free parameter. This is the beta, which will be higher necessarily in a demo than in ETA, but you have a knob. And the nice thing for those of you who are interested in the mathematics behind it, you might argue that if you change beta up and down, you will also change capital Q because you're changing your design. They are largely uncoupled. You look, there is beta. So there is the field and the H factor and R and they all go with very high powers, power to the third more or less, whereas this goes power to the point one. So if you change beta by a factor of two, never mind. The ignition curves looks exactly the same, but the fusion power changes quite a bit because we have the beta squared up here. So in some sense, H and beta, your MHD stability limit, beta, and H, your confinement quality, can be used to design independently this because one will be used in order, the H, in order to bring this denominator down and to get ignition, and the other one will be used to regulate the fusion power output of this. You could even envision a control scheme where you go up and down with beta in order to produce the fusion power that you want, and the ignition doesn't even care about it because if you go up and down 10% by beta and you have this to the power of 0.1, this, we can't even measure it probably with this precision. Okay, this for the tokamak. Now I said already, um, we can do the same for the stellarator. And this is fundamental plasma physics or say even nuclear physics, so it doesn't change. It's still n squared times t squared times the volume. So we have exactly the same formula for the fusion power. Just I normalize beta slightly differently, but it's the same thing. You use this confinement scaling, which is the International Stellarator Scaling Law, ISS04. And the only thing to, two things to know about is first of all, again, this is an empirical scaling, so it's a bit like the eta scaling. Second, the dependencies are not so different from what we have seen for the tokamak scaling. In fact, some of them are quite, so for example, there is a beta to the minus something, it's a bit smaller, and uh, there is this rho star and the H factor 2.5, and if you go back to what I had before, instead of five, it was 3.2, it's not a big, the beta is negative bit bigger, this was 0.79, now it's 0.7, so it is actually not such a big difference. And not surprisingly, you come up with a formula which all looks almost the same in here, of course. You will now insert a very different parameter for the aspect ratio because a stellarator is rather a bicycle uh, tire tube, whereas a tokamak is rather a donut. But you will encounter the same physics. And in fact, for a W7X type stellarator, which we call Helios reactor, ignition comes at 13 or 14 meter or 15 meter up here. And at this value, you would have something like 800 megawatts. So you can see it's very close to what we got for the tokamak. And again, you might assume that we run the beast at higher beta or change the B field. And if you do so, you produce more power. Here it is done by scaling the magnetic field, which changes a bit this curve as well. So 
In fact, although the machines look very differently, the underlying turbulent transfer is probably not so different. And in the end, the basic dependencies become very similar. And I, I like this very much when I prepared the talk some years ago for this with these simple models. Because sometimes you talk to the stellarator physicists and to the tokamak physicists and it looks like it's two complete different objects, completely different objects and two different worlds. And you couldn't put them on one page on this very simple mathematics. So now we come to something that's only a point for the tokamak, which is this current that you have to drive in the tokamak, which is not so nice. You always remember you have a transformer, you always have to have a certain loop volt voltage which drives your current and if you would not ramp down the current in the transformer to provide this loop voltage, the current would decay and your tokamak discharge would stop. So you have to always do it. And it either means you can drive the current or part of the current with other means than the loop voltage or you will have to stop as soon as your inductively driven current is over. And then you have to recharge the transformer and start restart the, uh, uh, the discharge. Of course, much, more, much nicer if you think you could run the tokamak in steady state as well. So again, for this, you can make a very simple model because, well, the tokamak is not more in this picture. It's nothing more than two big coils. One coil has a lot of windings and is the ohmic transformer in the middle. One coil has only one winding and is the plasma in here, so it's a transformer. And the flux in this will just go with a hole in the center and the magnetic field, of course. And the hole in the center, which is this area here, will go with R squared times some factor for the aspect ratio because the, the plasma, you can only start the solenoid where the plasma stops on the inside. So if you make the aspect ratio bigger than the ratio, then the, the space for the solenoid would shrink. But apart from this, you just have a total flux. And this total flux you consume by ramping up the current, which means you have an inductive part, L times I, which is the inductive flux, which actually you get back at the end of the discharge. And there is also a resistive consumption already versus the ohmic heating, which you get when you heat up this. And if you put this in, there is actually this, the ratio between this inductive and resistive flux is roughly a constant, the so-called EGMA constant. In the end, this means that the time scale on which you ramp up the current is sort of the L over the R time scale of the transformer of the plasma, which is the secondary loop of the transformer, which is not so surprising. If you put this in, you get the EGMA constant. So it's now very simple. You can calculate how much phi naught, how much of the magnetic flux you take in order to establish the plasma current. And the rest of this you consume by the conductivity of the plasma. And if the conductivity is very low, you have to apply a low loop voltage. If the conductivity would, sorry, if it, the conductivity is high, the resistance is low, it's low loop voltage, and if it becomes more, say, more resistance because you have lower temperature, for example, you will have to supply more voltage. It's very simple. So we say the resistive part of this is just, this is, uh, if you look, this is the conductivity. So this is a very simple formula for a resistor taken as a cylinder and then bent to a torus. And of course, it's proportional to the pulse length because when you consume flux constantly, the longer the pulse, the more flux you consume. And you have to drive a current in here. So this is in fact Ohm's law, if you like. You may not have recognized it, but this is the voltage, this is the resistance, and this is the current. U equals R times I, very simple. Um, there is something, this IP, I called IP star because this is only the ohmic part of the current because you only have to drive the part which you have to drive ohmically. If you manage to drive current with a different effect, and there are two effects which I put in here, this does not count in the flux balance. And the two things are external current drive. You have learned meanwhile that you can, with ECRH or with um, neutral beams, you can drive current. So you can safely take the ohmic current and subtract from it the ratio of current that you drive by current drive systems. Likewise, there is something called the bootstrap current, which I hope has been explained. Okay, okay. If it's very simple, if you have a pressure gradient in the plasma, a radial pressure gradient, this gives rise to a toroidal current in the plasma. And in tokamak, it's a very simple formula. It goes with a beta poloidal, goes to bootstrap fraction in this, and you can calculate how large this bootstrap fraction is by formula. And it is sort of a thermoelectric current. It's actually not such a surprising thing, right? Thermoelectric currents we know from everywhere. If you have 
metals, different metals at different uh, temperature, for example, you may see that there is a current uh, coming out of this. this is a thermoelectric effect and the Butzer current you might see as something like this as well. Okay, so we have the plasma current, which is one, so this is the total plasma current, and then uh, would be ohmic current minus the one which is driven with external systems, minus the bootstrap current, which again you have to fit in this simple formula, the rest is just the formula that whoever introduced the bootstrap current will have shown to you already. So again, you can take this and get a formula for the pulse length. Again, okay, this may be a difference in sort of um, what you, what you think is ugly or not ugly? If I look at math, so I look at mathematics and I see the Maxwell's equations. I find them beautiful because they have no strange exponents and have some symmetry and so on. I look at this thing. I find very ugly in the sense that there are strange exponents and it looks like it is a mess. But it's very simple in terms of mathematics because again it's only algebraic. And second, you might think of something useful if you can just plug it into your computer and plot versus the parameters and certainly you can do this here. So while this looks a bit involved, it's actually pretty simple and you can just produce a plot like this, which is for eta. This is now Richard's eta q equals 10 scenario. And this says here's the normalized pressure. Again, we have something like a resonance denominator, right? One minus something, minus the current, which basically says if you drive all the current externally, you do, your pulse length is an infinity because you don't have supply to supply the loop voltage anymore. Um, you look at this for the eta q equals 10 scenario, it's a mess because it means the normalized pressure for the bootstrap current, which needs high pressure, would have to be a value of 7.5 which may not be mean anything to you. If you go to a tokamak physicist and say, I need beta n 7.5, you will be kicked out of the room because it is two to three times any stability limit we can think about. So you could never run this plasma. So the question is, is there a solution? Of course, I wouldn't show it to you if I didn't have a solution. The solution is to say, I increase the current drive fraction, which is 10% in this eta scenario to maybe 50%. And I increase also, I decrease the plasma current and increase the plasma confinement such that I have to drive less current and I still have very good confinement. This is what is known as the eta q equals 5 or steady state scenario, which the, down here you can see the numbers for it. And this now at beta n 2.5 would already go to stationary at the expense of putting more power not really the power needed to heat the plasma in order to have this Q value. You need the power to drive the current. So you put ECRH power or neutral beam power just to drive the current. And this makes the system inefficient because you put external power just for the purpose of driving current. And so capital Q is 5 instead of 10. And this is only one variant of this. There can be many other variants. Okay, so we have now fusion power in capital Q we can make a spreadsheet type calculation and design a machine which has a certain Q and a certain fusion power. For a tokamak, we know what to do in order to calculate the pulse length. And the only thing we still need is this, if you like, energetics in order to close the loop and say, if this was a reactor, we want to produce electrical power. So the final thing we look at the thermal power. So the thermal power is the fusion power. Then actually, if you look very closely, there is a number bigger than one in front of this because the neutrons which go into the blanket lead to nuclear reactions and the nuclear reactions produce extra power. So the thermal power extracted from the blanket is actually a bit higher, like 10, 20% than the fusion power. You have the power which you put into the plasma to heat it, which you extract as well. So you can count for this as thermal power. It's not a good way to convert power because you put in 100 megawatts and if you take them out as thermal power and convert to electricity, it's only 30 megawatts, but you can still count for it. And there is a efficiency by which you think you can recycle the power for the so-called balance of plant as well. And balance of plant is everything else that you need in order to run the plant. So it could be pumps that pump the coolant through it. It could be the coffee machine in the operator's office, for example. Everything that the plant consumes itself, you could in principle recycle. Coffee machine is not such a big, such a good example because you would not take the hot water from the coffee machine and feed it into your turbine. But stuff like the pumps, for example, or you did, did uh, uh, the conversion of electrical energy into a heating system, you might think that some of this you can use. Pretty high temperature, so it could be a coolant that you use as well. 
Okay, and this is all we need, thermal power, then we have the thermodynamic efficiency. I already said for a very simple power plant these days you would assume maybe one third or so, 0.35, and out comes a total electric power. And now the game, different from, than from ITER, for a demo infusion power plant is not only to have a big capital Q, so to have more fusion power than auxiliary power, which is CD, now you have to look at the whole thing. So the whole auxiliary power is the current drive power, but divided by this eta CD, I already said, you will have to take more power from the grid. If you heat the plasma with 100 megawatt, you have to take 200 megawatt out of the grid, or 300 actually, depending on the system. And you have to put this balance of plant power, so whatever you do, the coffee machines, for example, you have to put in here. So, and this is electricity which you have to subtract from this. So in the end, you can look at a recirculating power fraction, which is the auxiliary power divided by the total power. And this means that you create, for example, one, say, you start with three gigawatt fusion power, a large plant. From the three gigawatt thermal power, you convert to one gigawatt electrical power. You would be very happy if you have, so one gigawatt, if you take out 100 megawatt in order to run the plant, your recirculating power fraction would be 10%. It means 10% of the power that you, electrical power you generate, you take out of this, and the rest you can sell for electricity. And in fact, 10% is a value that typical nuclear power plants, fission power plants, for example, come even below this or close to 10%. So this is a sort of a, a good number. If you make this, as I said already, if you make this exercise for ITER, uh, it will actually turn out that you do not produce any power, net electrical power in, in the end, which is why the machine has to be still also from energetics reason a bit bigger than ITER. And so we can just take this recirculating power fraction and we can plot it because what appears here, fusion power, are only things that we have calculated before. And if you do so, you will find, first of all, it's true what I said before, you will have to create at least a gigawatt of fusion power or more. So here is a gigawatt, here is two gigawatt, three gigawatt. In order to bring the recirculating power fraction down to maybe 10% or so. And second, the Stellarator does this much better than the Tokamak. And the reason is that the Stellarator doesn't need the current drive power. So unless you assume that you can drive almost all the current in the tokamak by the bootstrap effect, which means very high beta and means a lot of optimism, you will have to supply into a plasma, which is more, you could more or less run ignited, you will have to supply maybe 100 or 200 megawatt of current drive power in order to keep it stationary, if you want the tokamak to be stationary. And so if you supply, say, 100 megawatt of current drive power, with the efficiency I've said, it means immediately 200 or 300 megawatt of electricity you take from the grid. So if you have actually one gigawatt of, sorry, three gigawatt of fusion power, you still have to, this is then one gigawatt of electricity, you still have to take out 300. So it's one third in terms of the recirculating power fraction. And this is one of the effects why we think, at least we at IPP, who look at both lines, think that the Stellarator, if it is shown to be of the same quality in stability and plasma confinement, would make a much, much better tokamak, uh, sorry, a much, much better fusion reactor than the tokamak, because you don't have to drive all this current. On top of this, there are all these instabilities with the current which do not come in a Stellarator. But if you want to make this argument very simple, you can do it like this. And by the way, here is, this is just a net electrical power. It's the same thing like this, but it means in a, in a tokamak you have to produce at least one gigawatt of fusion power in order to make net electricity, which is consistent with what I said before. If you do 500 megawatt like in ITER, you will not generate any electrical power with this, whereas the Stellarator would start here at 100 or 200 already. You can actually, from this gap, you can work back how many coffee machines are running in the building, for example. Well, there is some other auxiliaries as well. Okay, so I've shown you now the, the equations to design all this. So now the question is, what does it actually look like if we apply our present knowledge and try to design machines from this? I start with the tokamak. I have shown you the step ladder ITER demo fusion power plant. Sorry, I have shown you the step ladder 
Astex upgrade, Jet and Ether, and Demo maybe. I will now argue we will do exactly the same thing with Ether, Demo and Diffusion Power Plant. So what we did recently, some two, three years ago, we made a study where we say, let's assume the same thing. Let's assume we run Ether and Ether is a success. Let's build a demo, but let's make sure that if from this demo we want to extrapolate to the fusion power plant, we should have a sound basis for extrapolation, which means we created a triple of machines, Ether being given already, so we don't create ITER, we have ITER already, it's the lower point in this. We look at a fusion power plant which has the same normalized parameters, wind tunnel approach, normalized parameters as ITER, and in between we locate a demo. And it, this is a very instructive thing, I think, you can do. So you say my new step later is ITER demo fusion power plant, we aim at an attractive fusion power plant, we scale it down to demo and look if we can run it in ETA. If not, actually we repeat the cycle because we want to base all this on ETA. And out comes something like this. On the left hand side, these are normalized parameters, the ones I've told you already, the safety factor, this Greenwald fraction. Okay, density you have to put as an absolute value because now we have looked at the exhaust. Beta, H factor, bootstrap fraction, stuff that we have talked about. And you can see for all three machines it's the same. And if you apply this and say, how can I make a triple that is an attractive fusion power plant and it also can be run in ITER, it comes out like this. ITER given six and a half, you actually you wouldn't even run ITER at the full field, but at 4.5 Tesla in order to have the scaling up there. Demo would turn out to be a bit less than eight meters and the fusion power plant eight and a half meters. And you have this step ladder in between and the thing which really changes is that of course you have to increase the field here, you increase with it the current and the fusion power goes from this 400 megawatt to 2 gigawatt in demo and then up to 3.5 gigawatt in the fusion power plant. And what is happening here is that while you do this the recirculating power fraction falls and in the end the net electrical power which comes out of this is 1 gigawatt. So 1 to 3.5 you can already see that you are close to the thermodynamic limit. So you have managed to make the machine so big and beta high enough such that you would drive the current in this that there is not such a big loss, internal loss of energy. Because if you think about this recirculating power fraction, if you would tell somebody you have an attractive fusion power plant which generates first of all heat and then you convert and you have electricity of one gigawatt but 0.9 of this one gigawatt stays in the machine to <laughs> supply coffee machines or whatsoever, well, heating power actually, and only 100 megawatt go out to the grid is never attractive. Here you can see we are close to the one third already, so we managed to do this. Of course, this is all with the 0D model, so what we then do is we take all our sophisticated codes, time dependent, modeling, this is the so-called Astra code, which is just one incarnation of these transport codes. We supply much better models than what I have done on a piece of paper with one free constant. And it turns out if you do the same study again with all these codes, you can get the normalized radii. Very instructive actually to see that these go to a limit where the fusion, if you like, the plasma is too hot already. The iron temperature is 60 kV, so you're out of the T squared of the best region for this, but this is the way it is because you cannot put the density higher because of this Greenwald limit. And you drive current with different methods. There is a bootstrap current which is this pink or magenta thing here. You have ECRH to shape the profile of the safety factor Q and you have neutral beam current drive and it up, adds up in this simulation to 100%. So I like this study very much as well because it said that what you do with the 0D model, which I shown you before, which is very simple, you can sort of back up with much better knowledge of the plasma physics. So what I've shown you before is as a zeroth order, you can actually play around with this and see if you optimize your own tokamak accelerator power plant and you will not be off by a large factor. You will be less off than with a cost estimate of this machine, I think that's for sure. The question is of course, can we run these discharges, which now this would be a stationary tokamak, so that the current is completely covered by bootstrap and by external current drive. Of course, we have done experiments like this in R6 upgrade. You may have seen them before during the week, I don't know. Um, we ramp up the heating power in the R6 upgrade discharge. This is the plasma current, the blue guy constant. We ramp up the beta, so sort of beta N3-ish up here. 
By this, we drive 50% of the plasma current by the bootstrap. So 50% doesn't have to be driven by the ohmic transformer because of the bootstrap current. And the other 50% are supplied by ECRH and by neutral beams. And if you look at the loop voltage, which is the transformer voltage you still need to supply, is close to zero, actually. So you can actually see we come close, not yet identical, but close to the normalized values, which I have shown you before for this step ladder. Again, the idea being that you have a wind tunnel approach where you say, if I can get some of the normalized parameters the same as I assume for ETA, demo, fusion power plant, I have much more confidence in the scaling of this. It needs further development, it's clearly encouraging. You can do the same thing for the stellarator. I'm coming close to the end. The question for the stellarator is actually we have W7X, which is a five meter major radius, 10 meter, it's a very large machine. But since you have a very large aspect ratio, actually, if you look at the plasma cross section, it's not very different than R6 upgrade, for example. So if you think about where this W7X sits in an extrapolation for the stellarator, it's rather Aztec's upgrade than JET. So the question is if you want to buy a stellarator, sorry, if you want to build and then buy a stellarator power plant, you need a JET, you need an ETA, you need a demo, you need only an ETA, only a demo. It's difficult to answer and so we, we made some studies on this. So this is normalized parameter, so you normalize in the right way the magnetic field and the heating power. And you can see beta is the same in ASICS upgrade, jet, eta, and demo, roughly. So you can scale up and down in this. But of course, the LAMA radius normalized becomes smaller and smaller going in this direction. And also the collisionality, so that the collision rate of the particles becomes smaller and smaller in this direction. And Richard looked at this and said, we have ASICS upgrade and machines, and jet is the biggest one, and we have eta up here. You can also look and say, I have demo here, and it's a very uncomfortably large step to go from ASICS upgrade jet up to demo. So we're very happy we have ETA somewhere in between here. And if you ask yourself the same question for the Stellarator, we have the old W7AS advanced Stellarator, which was run here in Garching, copper coils, and really not so great performance compared to all this. We have W7X, which sits somewhere in here where you have maybe a six upgrade, not even jet. And then you have up here the Stellarator power reactor Helios. And it's a very large area which you want to cover. And you could actually take different decisions how to do this, depending on how much money you have and how much you are willing to take risks or adventures in this. And say, OK, never mind. Our theoreticians are very clever guys, so they can predict everything 100%. I will build this machine. You can say, I, I will build an eater somewhere in between here. You could also say, I will build a demo up here. And so we made some studies of this, different options in this study. Paper is given down here if you're interested. And the plot is a diagram in magnetic field and major radius. And then you fold in all the physics that you can and look where this sits. And this is Q equals 10. So this is, if you like, an ETA option. There is no tritium breathing. Q is 10. You don't produce electricity. And you would end up somewhere at 14 meters major radius and 4.5 Tesla on axis, which is very nice because you can use the existing technology. You could actually live with niobium tin for this year. Uh, niobium titanium. And whereas niobium 3 tin, I'm sorry, you would have to use for the advanced technology. If you do a demo like, you would go here. So you have higher field and you have a machine which is 18 meters or so instead of 14 meters and it would have to be treat himself sufficient in this. And then the question is where does this end up in the strategy? And we actually think, if you think a bit about this, the plasma physics is something where you really want to see the experimental confirmation because you have all these nonlinearities. So what you want is you want to see the alpha heating in the machine. You want to see the turbulent transport. You want to see that your scaling from the codes are reproduced in the thermonuclear regime. So if you say you build an eta like stellarator, which is the cheaper option, you will have to do all this technology. But we will, of course, assume that the tokamak is going on at the same time. So one attractive strategy could be we have the tokamak line, as is upright jet, eta demo. 
You have W7X, you have an Helios Eater, so you don't have to build a demo. You test all the technology in this demo device and then you feed it into the Stellarator. And when the race is up for commercial fusion in somewhere in the 2050s plus, you could actually choose if you take the Stellarator or you take the Tokamak. And this is one of the ways to sort of catch up for the Stellarator because the Stellarator is just in technical development and plasma physics parameters behind what we have. And we, you will never make up for this if you want to build an ether and a demo at the same time or sequentially. And so the question is just how would you do this? One idea would be to say if I have a code which produces the number of tritium molecules produced in the tritium blanket very well. It should not matter too much if this has a bean shape or has a banana shape, the tritium blanket, or it has this other 3D shape. So the technology you would think which you develop for the tokamak you could use in the Stellarator as well. But all the alpha heating stuff and so on, we think at least as plasma phys physicists, we think we should really show this in an experiment. So this is a possible route up to a Stellarator reactor. There is one final question on this you could think about, which is the cost of this. The Stellarator is so much bigger, but then it has a very large hole in the middle, which costs nothing. So if you want to do this a bit more scientifically, you can use a big code, which takes all the components into account and looks at the price. This has been done some time ago in a PhD work, actually, in Greifswald. And surprisingly, at least to my surprise, it turned out that the 22 meter Helios machine is of the same cost, more or less, than the 8.5 meter Tokamak. It's a bit surprising. Well, one reason I've said already, because it, it is not major radius. It is volume in the end that you have to pay for. So the volume is not by large amount bigger than this, but it's still 30-40% bigger or so but you don't have to buy all the stuff which drives your current. So the externals are not as expensive for the Stellarator, Stellarator as for the Tokamak. And the other thing I've never really thought about before this study so much, but is very apparent if you think of Richard Pitt's talk, a Stellarator doesn't have poloidal field coils. A stel the, the largest Stellarator coil is smaller than a toroidal field coil of a Tokamak and yet the poloidal field coils are even bigger. These are the ones which you cannot even produce at a, fact, at a factory and then ship over to ITER because they, they are so large they will not, will not fit on the roads and on, on the trucks that Richard has shown you. And it turns out that if you make the tokamak still a bit bigger and bigger, the poloidal field coils become quite a problem. So this becomes very expensive technology and very expensive to manufacture, and this does not exist because of this you remember this Helios design with the modular coils. The coils look very complicated because of the 3D structure. But if you look at them in size, you may have noticed one of them for W7X when you come in here in the morning. It's only a case of one, not a coil, no coil inside. You, you need, don't need to drill a hole to get out the superconductor. There's nothing in there. But it is actually, you can see this, this is it. And this may be times two or two and a half for the reactor, and that's it. Whereas the poloidal field coil of 20 and 30 meter diameter will be a large beast to do. And it actually adds a lot into the cost of this year. Our EU strategy to fusion power consists of several elements. There are the present day experiments which lay the physics basis for this, like Aztec's upgrade, which you have seen here, like W7X, like MAST in the UK, JET in the UK, TCV in Switzerland, and so on. We have all these this nice portfolio of machines in which we do these experiments. We will have ITER that demonstrates self-heating at Q equals 10. This is the main purpose of ITER. Of course, there is all the technology as well, but if you sort of tick off boxes on the path to the reactor, you would say Q equals 10, the large power amplification and the self-heating of the plasma, this is ITER. And you have demo for the tritium self-sufficiency and for routine electricity production. And when I say electricity production, the routine is maybe the more important. Everybody believes that if you can make water, if you can heat up water up to 300 or 350, whatever it is, degrees Celsius before it goes to the triple point, you can actually create electricity from this with very regular and standard equipment. It is more here that you think you want to have this beast running not only for 10 minutes, but for hours and for days 
and maybe for months or so in a reliable fashion. And if you have shown this, and this is a big thing to imagine these days when you work on present day Togomax where we have 10 second discharges and every third discharge we break something and then we go and repair. It's very difficult to imagine, but of course this will not be an experiment, this will be a thing which is done by industry with one purpose, namely fit in order to run for this time. And maybe I should say this, whenever I think about this and uh, think about the extrapolation and is it, it's difficult, yes, but you should rather imagine yourself being Charles Lindbergh and you have just crossed the Atlantic with a small propeller, one propeller, one engine thing and you land and somebody comes and says, okay, in 60 years from here there will be airplanes which carry 500 persons in one airplane. The pilots will enter into the airplane and then push buttons and then sit back and relax while the thing flies over the Atlantic. And this will be done in a cost efficient and so safe manner that people will travel on and be just very happy. And in fact, it will be safer to travel than with a car. So I think then Charles Lindbergh would have had the same problem to imagine this than maybe we have when we run Aztec's upgrade and break something and think that demo should run in, uh, I don't know, one year or so without breaking. On the other hand, it's a long way to go. And once you take it out of the hands of the physicists who always want to play and mess things up and give it to the engineers, you might very well converge to something that is viable. Okay, so ETA is on its way to the first plasma in the mid-2020s and Q equals 10 in the mid-2030s. The size of a fusion power plant, I've shown you, is determined by several elements. Ignition prescribes a minimum major radius, seven and a half meters roughly for the tokamak, 15 meters for the Helios, the Stellarator. And the economic attractiveness drives P-fusion up to overcome this offset P-current drive. Remember three gigawatt or so that you would need for this. And at present, the designs are mainly used to evaluate basic trends. And as I said before, fusion power plant will be built 2050, so future improvements can be incorporated. And actually we need more sophisticated analysis before we spend several billion euros, but we are still in a phase where we sort of explore and see what is possible. And in fact it's very important because it tells us exactly these are the parameters where we better put a lot of brains into it because they matter a lot and others maybe don't matter so much so we can live with what we have. Okay, and we have in the EU and in Germany the parallel development of Stellarator line, so we could still switch horses if we find out that one horse, which in the beginning looked to be behind, takes over and is faster, we can still change the saddle to the Stellarator if we like and then go to the finish line on the one whichever is the fastest.